the guy who ran the place, Roger Eagle, and uh, was you know you'll speak to many people in Liverpool, and they will quote you, quote him as as a major influence mm -hmm. on the, the 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 music scene. I was like 14 and a half, 15, and he was about six foot six and big and smelly. He was enormous for me. Uh, you know, he was this giant hulking man. Uh, he looked like a bit of a porno actor. Just a big smelly old man who owned the club. And I actually thought he was Eric. 99% <laughs> of the, the universe doesn't have a person like Roger Eagle to instigate their music scene for him. Maybe there's... And I think Liverpool is a better place for it, really. And so is Manchester for what he did, obviously, with the twisted wheel. He booked a lot of those, what well, now are very well-known American black acts. You know, Solomon Burke, Wilson Pickett. You know, screaming Jay Hawkins. He would put them on in Manchester, and so he'd been doing that. I think ever since, really, in one form or another. The enormous enthusiasm that came from Roger Eagle for the music was, you know, absolutely the driving force of the place. He was one of those people. He got things going. You know, he'd take a chance. He was just a, a music fan. And he used to put these gigs on that made a lot of money. Things like, you know, that were big sellers, things like the Damned and the Stranglers or whatever, that he knew could get a big audience because it would give him the, the freedom to tinker about and put like things on that he liked. You could see the clash one night, and the following night you'd see Prince Farley, one of the reggae greats, you know, then followed by maybe a Cajun band. I, I saw him very near uh, to his, his death, and he was still excited about music. He, he looked really thin and, and very unwell. But he'd, he'd come up to me and go, have you heard this one yet? Yes. Have you heard? He didn't lose his enthusiasm. I you spoke know, so to him. So thrust in records yeah. in front of him. Yeah. So you've got to listen to this. You know, so he, he was still there right at the very end. I mean, I spoke to him about a week before he died and he was still so enthusiastic. And I, I knew that he wouldn't last. I mean, us. He was still so enthusiastic about things. And that was like a week before he died. <laughs> All the clubs that were around at the time, most of them were like sort of, you know, there was a lot of heavy metal and sort of like just ordinary long-haired rock music sort of things. It took, I would say, just prior to Eric's deaf school to revitalise the live music scene. And then Eric's came along. I used to go and watch a lot of gigs in and around town. There was nowhere, certainly was nowhere club land like Eric's. The first night I actually remember uh, it was when the Pistols played. There's only about a hundred people turned up <coughs> for the Sex Pistols. Sex Pistols. I went down with Pete Burns and them, and Paul Rutherford from Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Pete Burns from Dead or Alive, Julian Cope. I was probably one of the many people who didn't go and see the Sex Pistols gig. Um, I wanted to go, that was early on. All my friends didn't want to go, so as it was, we didn't go that night. I didn't realise the band was going to be as big as they were. Maybe six months later. You know, you couldn't see them for loving the money, really. I saw them on So It Goes with Tony Wilson, um, and that's the first I'd witnessed of them, and I thought, we've only just missed these. We know that looked like something worth seeing, and that's what I regret. Then they'd appear somewhere under a different name, and you'd be rushing around, going to this place, and then found out it was none. You know, so I think in really very few people actually saw, saw the pistol. <laughs> Even to this day, I can't believe I saw as many bands um, as I did. It was just uh, unbelievable. You know, like Wire. 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 Julian Coke. Generation X. Def School. Rockin' Doops. Biggie Pop. Biggie Pop. Banshees. The Adverts. Magazine. Adam and the Ants. Joy Division. Joy Division. Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. The Undertone. Killing Joe. The Gang of Four. The Stranglers. The Rosillos. The Rosillos. Link Ray. The Ramones. The Specials. Buzzcocks. Talking Heads. Crass. The Desperate Bicycles. Souls and the Dogs. Aswad. Her Ruben. The Sex Pistols. Sex Pistols. Jam. ATV. The Cramps. The Cramps. The Cramps. The Delta 5. Ultravox. The Au Pairs. Steph Little Fingers. Wiley. The Damned. The Damned. The Damned. The Damned. The Costello. The Sham 69. Link Ray. The B-52s. The only ones. Penetration. Big in Japan. The psychedelic fears. Dead or alive. Pop group. Nightmares and wax. The clash. Clash. The clash. The clash. The clash. The clash. The clash. Always. Any time the clash were on, they, they just stunned me every time. 
the clash well, eternally and will ever be, you know. And so the fact that they they played there not once, not twice, three times, you know, and it, it was just incredible. A life changing moment, really. The atmosphere, you know, you could, I don't know how they managed to get so many people in that place. It must have been about 500 over the, the legal limit, you know. Great performance, like, wow, <laughs> madness, live, exciting, cool. Joe looked great. The clash gig I saw was just like the match, you couldn't move. I like the, the, the general feeling of not being able to escape. Even if you were stood at the bar or wherever, you couldn't escape that noise. It was so bloody loud. I wasn't interested in the nihilism of, of you know, uh, some of the punk bands, or their philosophy of, like, you know, no future and all that. I wanted to do, you know, I wanted a, an alternative to that. I wanted something positive, and the clash talked about you know, dead end jobs, um, American imperialism, all that stuff, which was appealing to me. It was really a, a sense of that you could change the world. I thought you really could think, you know what I mean, you could make a difference. And really, that might sound corny nowadays to a lot of people, but that was all we had, really. And it did really mean everything to you, you know what I mean? Everything. Well, they talked about fighting back and, and mm. being constructive. Yeah. Um, and those influences, it, have influenced my life to this day. The last gig he ever done was in Liverpool uh, with the Mescaleros in November at Liverpool Uni. And uh, we went down and seen him there, you know. And he was, he was in great spirits, he was fine, you know. Uh, he looked great, it was a great show and everything. And then just, you know, just before Christmas, we got that really bad news, which is uh, just... I still can't quite believe it now that he's gone, you know, because um, without a doubt, he, he was um, a great man, you know. Great rock and roller and definitely affected also my life. A great impact on me. When Joy Division played the first few times, they were like Warsaw. They, they were still called Warsaw. I mean, it's the Warsaw. I just remember the they, they were just always shit. They changed the name to Joy Division. And Will Out the Bunny Man coming into like the bar and everyone's just sort of being cool and it's like a oh, fucking war saw on again, he changed the name, who cares? And then suddenly Will comes in and he goes, You've got to hear this. I don't know how, but they're brilliant. They were great. And we they all just filed in them. and he were doing like are. she's lost control, transmission. And he were like They sort of ceased to be like this sort of something saying me punk band and after especially after Unknown Pleasures came out and they they, they went out and they, they you know to promote Unknown pleasures, and they, they were they were a completely different band. You know what what happened there? Just you know, there was no transition period. Crap, genius. But every it, time they played, it was just amazing. <coughs> you know, the night it's several things. But the, the night that the the Ian Curtis collapsed on stage, and he had the fit, and it all got a bit weird just before Christmas. Uh, that was, for me, one of the greatest gigs I've ever seen. It was all on, you know, all the showbiz stories, you know, he only does all that stuff because he's, he's epileptic, and it was like, you, know, we can't, you can't do it to order when you're epileptic. Mm. It must, there must be something about it, you know. In fact, with Joe Strummer dying recently, they, like, the big stars that die, to me, it was always like, it was like when Ian Curtis died, you know, opening the NME, and it was like, Ian Curtis has killed himself. You know? mm. That was like, above all, like Elvis and Lennon and Marley. People you know, people you'd seen around in Eric's and whatever got bands together. And that was one of the important things about punk and about, um, you know, the, the whole uh, ethic of punk, or one of the ethics, was to give local bands an opportunity to play and get up, do it yourself. Well, there was a, a new band formed early every <laughs> week, wasn't there? There was, and there was bands that supposedly formed that never formed at all, at like all. the Crucial Three, yes. which always gets mentioned, <laughs> but uh, they never, never happened. It was wonderful just going around like the Matthew, Matthew Street area and seeing all these like wonderful people, like, you know, preening themselves and making an effort to, to go out and, and be noticed. Basically, even if they weren't in bands, they wanted to be noticed as an individual, you know? Like Jane Casey and that, you know? I remember running over to Jane and just saying, I think your band's amazing. And it was big in Japan, and you listen to it now, and it's like, they're anything but amazing. 
big in Japan came about because they were all like friends or acolytes of deaf school, and deaf school were on tour in the States, so they were all bored stiff. So they formed this band. Jane Casey uh, was the singer. And it was just like a mad joke, really. They used to have like, uh, more or less one song, which used to be big in Japan, big in Japan, big in Japan, that's it, and used to scream this out. It's like a super group in reverse. If you look at the members of Big in Japan, you know, they've all gone on to do like loads of different things that have been very important in like English music. The, the bigger Liverpool bands at the time, like the Bunny Man and uh, Teardrop, etc., I saw their first gigs uh, there. Pete Wiley wanted to be Bruce Springsteen, McCulloch wanted to be David Bowie. You know, it was like, I think it was like everybody, everybody wanted to be somebody else except for like Pete Burns. You know, because he just knew who he was. All of those bands seemed to be much more interesting and appealing early on, you know, when, when they got big, if you like, and they started to have brass sections and things, it had all really lost it for me. I was at the age where, you know, you'd sit and watch them on telly and then you'd be with your mum and dad and on top of the pops would come on and I'd be like, oh, I know them, I know them. So, yeah, you know, it was good luck to most of them. You know, sort of... Uh, Good luck to the ones who made it and sort of kept in touch. But then you got the ones who just thought they were total pop stars from day one. And uh, where are they now? Probe was very important. You know, it would have been like just round the corner. It was just a focal point for everybody to go meet beforehand. We used to import American punk singles and French punk singles. Uh, and the Stiff label, which at that time were only independent records, you could hardly get a hold of them. You know, we were the only shop in town selling all this stuff. So when we moved down to Button Street, uh, to the Big Pro shop, again, we just became the punk place. Well, it was a focal point, really. Um... The whole of Matthew Street became a focus because there was pro, you know, people could buy the records, hang about, as, as a lot of people did. And likewise, in the evening, you'd see pretty much those same people go to Eric's. People used to bounce backwards and forwards Saturday afternoon, spend all day in probe, and then just go round to the grapes Saturday evening and sit there and wait there until, until the club opened. But through there, you'd pick up. Again, the, 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 you know, the constant thirst for knowledge, you know, the music, the game that you would never have heard of. I can be both very helpful and I can sell stuff like mad because somebody would come over with something, say, and um, there might be like a, a recent artist and you may be mentioned, well, if you like this fellow, he's influenced by, you know. So uh, that sort of thing, which Norman had as well. But we did have a reputation generally for being cared. In Probe, it's just like if you'd come in and you'd ask for some album that one of them disapproved of, they'd just tell you to bug it off and just laugh at you. Or they'd just go into the back room and make a cup of tea and have a ciggy and wait for you to go. I remember asking Norman if they had uh, Virginia playing by Roxy Music on 7-inch. And, um, and he said, I'll go and have a look in the back. And I said, like, you know, I only want to know if you got it, I don't want it now. And he went, they're fine. Went out the back. He said, "Yeah, we got one copy left." And I said, "Okay, like I'll call back for it." And he went, "You don't want it now?" And I said, "No, I told you that." And he went, "Fine," and slung it against the wall, and it just shattered. And I thought, "You horrible little get!" And then I got to know him. I never got any better. I always <laughs> thought, "You horrible little get!" I think everybody who worked in Probe had another agenda. I think they thought that they were more important than than both the records, the punters, and the shop itself. And um, so therefore, the punters were probably just something that got tolerated and also a figure of fun. Some fella came in and brought, like, Bruce Springsteen, Born to Run, and a Patti Smith LP, and walked out, fell down the stairs and broke them, just, you know, as he fell. Walked immediately straight back in and said to Jeff, these are broken. <laughs> And he, he was just going, well, I've just seen you fall, it's not my fault. And he made him buy them again anyway, and as he put them in the bag, he went like, do you want me to smash them now, or do you want to wait till I get outside? That was one of the great things about having your own shop. Before, you said, I'd worked in shops, you'd, be, you'd always be, able to be on your best fucking behaviour and all that. And then if somebody's getting on your nerves, you'd just say, get out my fucking sight, you know, you can have the fucking record and all this business. 
You could just say what you like to them. They were so knowledgeable. They knew their shit, you know. They, once you'd go past the barrage of insults, if you actually could get the question to them, they'd know exactly what you were on about and what you wanted and where exactly in the shop you could find it, you know. And uh, you need something like that. Everybody says he needs one. <laughs> There was never any trouble at Eric's. Um, and I think most people will tell you that. There was loads of trouble. It was generally extremely peaceful. There was trouble at Clash gigs, there was trouble at Adam and the Ants gigs. And I've never had any trouble, and none of my friends did, and we never even saw any trouble in there. There was always loads of fights there. I mean, like the Cockney Rejects, they were like, they were there going on about, you know, football. They were all like, so they were sort of football hooligans. And most of the people who went to Eric's just, they, they went there because they weren't into football. You know, people who were into football used to beat the likes of us up. Didn't you? There were no drugs around, and had there been drugs around... <laughs> where, where I was, you were in the wrong corner. <laughs> <laughs> no one I knew was sort of taking drugs or anything, any sort of speed. I know some of the bands were, but the people who were there... <laughs> well, I was younger. <laughs> I was there all the time, man. You know, obviously you could smell weed in there. But then, you know, show me a rock club in the history of the universe where you can't smell weed in there at some point. But I didn't, was never aware of, like, massive drug taking going on in there. The toilets were, like, that deep in urine. Urine on the floor. About that, about that. God, the toilets in Eric's, I've just remembered. I don't want to go down that road, actually. The, the measure days. of a good club, I always think, is how many men are in the girls' carpets and how many men are in the girls' toilets. Well, you know, just what goes on in the girls' toilets. <laughs> Do you really want me to tell you? No, I don't really want to elucidate about that. Like, that's all X-rated, so, um, you know, and also, like, there's, there could be some girls, like, out there that, like, you know... <laughs> you meet a girl or something like that, and you just... You just, you just type it a quickie, like, you just go into the girls' cubicles and they basically have sex in the toilets. It's a mess up. It's a fuck up. That to tight, really, as well. Uh, it didn't just fade away, you know, it didn't just go like worse and worse and more commercial and become another club. It ended on an up, really. There were still good bands coming and playing, but it just didn't seem to have that initial excitement that first happened when Eric's took off. Well, I don't think Eric's as a club was going down, it was just the music in general, it was all that sort of new wave and uh, sort of mod stuff. The bands that had started the whole scene had become so big that they couldn't play a little club like that anymore. And the bands that come, that were coming through, with the exception of, I don't know, Joy Division, Wire, Tito Explodes, Bunny Man, they were shit. I think it went out on a good note, especially the last night when we got raided. I remember being there the last night, and it was, uh, cos it did go over, cos I liked the psychedelic fairs, they were good bands, you know, when they were first going, they were brilliant. There was Waste Ground opposite Eric's at that time. And we were just walking across the waste ground when all these police vans and cars suddenly, suddenly appeared. We were all just standing there. Next thing, all these sort of, like, people stood up and burst in and started grabbing all the people, taking drinks off everyone. Didn't identify themselves as police, because a couple of lads I know got stuck away for it. Because, you know, getting grabbed hold of by someone, so you give them a slap, next thing it's, you've assaulted the police officer. The coppers that come in, like, were really bad, you know, they were, like, thumping girls. A friend of mine, who's a teacher, was pulled up the stairs by her hair. They closed all the doors so nobody could get out, but actually, I think Christine Ruth, who was on Radio City at the time, Christine, she was actually in there and she actually got out and ran round to Radio City offices. So they put it out on the news that night and it went all around the country. I thought, you know, you can't do this without it being noticed. You know, and I mean, it was, it was one of the most significant clubs at the time in Britain and known by young people all over the country. And I just thought, you know, everybody should know about it. It was supposed to be the last night of Eric's anyway, a couple of days later, but the police just raided it sort of like three or four nights before it shut, just for spite, purely for spite. Eric's got a lot of support after that. There was a huge march. It really did feel like it mattered that they were trying to close down this thing that was like ours and we weren't really ours, doing any yeah. harm there. 
we looked a bit shocking, we were a bit loud, we were a bit raucous, but we weren't actually doing that, was the irony. There were probably people going to straight clubs that were doing much worse things and we weren't doing any of that. And there was that sense of like outrage that no, and a brilliant feeling on the march. Well, I did go on the march. Fantastic. Fantastic, what can I say? Best march I've ever been on. very good friends with Roger so he was thinking for the next couple of weeks what to do and I know that finances were not good anyway at the club I mean it wasn't only about the police raid although I think that was the final straw. Well, I think even Roger realised that he'd run his course to be honest I don't think he could have taken it anywhere else. A bit of a sad day like but you know all good things come to an end but I'm glad it went out with a bang rather than a whimper I'd have hated to have just seen like the likes of myself, sort of some sad owl people trying to relive it. It reopened as Brady's then, but it, it didn't have the same. You know, you go down there and watch the odd band, like, but it lost it by then, really. The lasting effect is I still work in the music biz, I still do the same sort of job now that I was doing then, where, you know, I was humping boxes and stuff. So, I mean, it got me into the job that I do now and the job that I've done for the last 25 years. Because people just didn't form bands, you know what I mean, and just go off and become a rock star although some people did. People became filmmakers and journalists and, you know, accountants. But they, 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 if they became accountants, accountants in a completely different way, you know? And I think, yeah, I think undeni undeniably, it had a large effect on, on my life even. Uh, that sort of still echoes to this day. My brother, or, or all his mates, or all my sort of uh, peers, and that was quite blinkered in what they listened to. I, I was just like open to anything. And like, you know, it made me want to form a band. And then when I actually formed like my own band properly, it was an amalgamation of all these different styles. It was like a bit of jazz, a bit of reggae, a bit of punk, everything sort of thrown in there. Everything was acceptable, you know. The club was bloody dead and gone years ago, you know, but by and large, you know, we're still hanging with the same people. Still, still, still friends with the same people. And I've shared an enormous amount of experiences with those people. I had the courage to open my own club up in the end, Planet X, which a lot of people actually said did remind them of Eric's, but I don't know whether it's because it was me that was, you know, there. Um, well, I think we've got a lot to thank Roger for. Thinking about it, there wasn't even anything that special about it, you know. It was just a club where a lot of people met their mates. And, uh, but I think it was just the time. Um, things seven spot.